to talk a little bit about Palm Sunday and Jesus weeping. And I'm going to read some scriptures from, uh, from the uh, Matthew, I mean Luke. I, I had my Bible turned to the wrong place. Luke 19, 28 through 44. That might just come up here, and it's a little bit bigger for me reading up here than the Bible, so let me read it here. And when he had thus spoken, he went before, ascending up to Jerusalem. When it came to pass, when he was come nigh to Bethpage and Bethany, at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples. I want you to think about this passage of Scripture a little bit, about what he did here. He said, Go ye into the village over against you, in which at your inner you shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man said. In other words, a colt that had never been written. Loose him and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, Why do you loose him? Thus shall you say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. And when they were sent, went their way, and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owner thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garment upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now, at the, at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among them, the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that, if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And when he, when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. Saying, this is an important part about what Christ was saying was fixing to take place at a later time. Saying, if thou hast known even thou, at least in this day, the things which belong to thy peace, they are hidden from their eyes, thy eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, that thy enemy shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side. And he shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because they knew it not the time of thy visitation. In the passage of scriptures that we read, Jesus stopped for a moment, and he sent two of his disciples ahead of him into a nearby village to carry out a special errand. Here is how Luke records that event. The two disciples must have wondered about what Jesus told them to do. Because none of the Gospels account about the ministry of Christ ever mention him riding any animal to get from one place to another. He must have walked hundreds of miles up and down the land we now call the Holy Land. There is no mention of him ever riding except in a boat across the Sea of Galilee. So when Jesus told the, told the, the two disciples to go and find this colt and bring it to him, and they must have been a little confused because he never wrote anything. He was always walking. It is obvious, though, that Jesus knew what he was going to face in the city of Jerusalem. So his decision to go into Jerusalem must have been one of the most difficult Jesus had ever made. And on top of that, to ride into the city on a colt, rather than to walk into it as he had often done before, must have been even more a difficult decision. Because riding a colt into the city was a public declaration that he was king. Now think about that. He always walked into the city of Jerusalem. He walked different places, but this time as he was going into the city of Jerusalem, he was coming riding on a colt, which represented his kingship, that he was coming as a king. So let me give you a little illustration of kind of how that, that kind of takes place back at that particular time. You see, in a time of war, the conqueror would ride upon a prancing stag. But in the time of peace, the king would ride a colt to symbolize that peace prevailed. So for Jesus to ride into Jerusalem upon a colt is to declare that he is the king. How many know that Jesus is our king today? Amen? So I want you to think about that just a little bit. When the, when the kings went to war back, back at that time, and when they conquered somebody, they came in prancing on a stag. But when everything was good and calm, they came riding in on a colt. Jesus symbolized him riding in on this colt, recognizing that he is the king of kings. 
And I don't know about you, but he's still my king today. He's been my king ever since he was part of my life. And he will always be my king. How about you? Amen? So how do you think people responded to that during that period of time? I try to take myself back to that period of time when I can't do it. And the reason I can't do it, they don't have air conditioning. I gotta have a little bit of AC. <laughs> they walked everywhere they went. I like to ride. Uh, now Sheila can walk a lot. I don't care for walking a whole lot. They ate what they could find. I like going down to Win Dixie, get me some meat, and have a have a steak or something. So I try to visualize what that time frame must have been been like. And, and to try to understand how the disciples and the followers of Christ, how they responded when he got he put himself upon this cult that had never been written. And I, and I really, I really kind of try to dig into that. Now I was reading, and, and, I, and I told Sandy I wasn't going to share it. Me and Sandy was talking about it. I'm going to share it today. Because I only found one historian that wrote this. And, and so I kind of had to get three or four different historians that when, when I want to make a comment, but I'm going to just go ahead and give a comment. When Jesus was coming in, to Jerusalem, there was a, a great throng of people, a lot of crowds of people, but at the same time, the Roman, and there were Roman soldiers there also, you'll find out about that a little bit later. But on the other side of the city, the Roman Empire had just been in battle, had just won a battle, and this historian said they were coming in. So that compound, the argument about who was the king, the Roman Empire was not happy about Jesus coming riding in on a cult when the other Romans had been battling. Now, I found that from one historian, so I, I, I can't say that that's there, but I, it kinda, I, I kind of put that together, and I, I can see the anger, and I can see all the different things that was happening at that time. But how would the people respond? I'm sure the Roman Empire didn't respond too good. Would they recognize that his kingdom, when Jesus came riding in on, the, on this colt or this donkey, did, would they recognize his kingdom was not of this world, that it was a spiritual kingdom, that he was to be a spiritual king, Probably not. Because he had been teaching them for that, that for three and a half years, and they still had not learned that lesson. And I want to share something with you before I go to follow. We have been preaching of the coming of our Lord and Savior for a long time. People say they believe in God, but they still question, is he really coming back again? Well, let me tell you something. According to the Word of God, and according to the Spirit of God that I feel in my spirit, he is coming back again. We must be ready. Amen? Amen. I wonder how many people is going to be left on this earth when he does come and rapture the church. Because people say, I just can't, couldn't believe it. I can't. Even though it's been taught to me. And, and here Jesus had preached and told them that he was a spiritual king. And that he was going to set his kingdom back up. They had never learned that lesson. I'm not saying that we're too much different today. I'm just going to leave that one there, okay? Perhaps some of them would greet him with laughter. Maybe they would be amused by what Jesus was doing. After all, it was rather a ridiculous picture to some of them. Here he is a carpenter declaring himself to be a king. And they said he, he, he doesn't even qualify to be a king in their mind. I can could, I could imagine that. But they didn't see the spiritual part of it. And they didn't recognize him truly as the Son of God. How many know that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you know that today? If you don't, you need to get to know who he is. <coughs> Others would greet him with anger. Upset because they would interpret his riding into the city as arrogant or blaspheming against God. Of course, many would hail him with joy, welcome him as an earthly king, come to reestablish the throne of David, and overthrow the Roman Empire. They were ready and eager to place the crown upon his head. Among the crowd would be people he had healed. Some had been even among the thousand he had fed. Many more had seen some of his miracles and listened as he spoke with authority. They had listened. Their lives had been changed. Jesus knew all of this. He knew that just over the horizon was the cross, looming like a monster, ready to consume him. But Luke tells us that in spite of it all, Jesus set his face steadfastly to go into Jerusalem. Jesus had a mission. He had a, he had a, had a, had a calling that he had to get done. He, he knew what was going to happen to him, but he still had to go. So we find here Jesus is riding towards the city, the gates of the city. 
As Jesus rides down towards the gate of the city, the crowds are growing. And there is a festive air. For it was Passover, and pilgrims are gathered from far and near for this great of all Jewish holidays. Even before Jesus had arrived, the news had spread that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. You can imagine the excitement that prevailed. Now, can you imagine if we knew somebody was coming into town and we just heard the word he raised somebody from the dead? I wonder how many of us would flock out to see him. Yeah. Think about that. You can imagine it's like, well, have you heard the news? Lazarus died, was buried in a tomb, so long that his body started to decay. But this teacher from Nazareth called Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth. And this one guy said, I saw him. They stripped away the great clothing. He actually walked and breathed and lived again. Surely only the Messiah, only the Son of God could do that. And I want you to know today, only the Son of God is capable of doing that. Amen? Amen. Yes. How many of you have ever been touched by the Son of God, by the healing hand of the Lord? Amen? Amen. How did you know it was God? Yes. You know it was God because you know who He is. Amen? Yes. If you know who He is, then we should just worship Him. And give him the praise. So I think about this. And I think about these things. How all that took place during that period of time. The news probably traveled from one person to another. And to find out when Jesus was ready to enter the city, the great crowds had collected on both sides of the road. They were there. They had cut palm branches and were shouting, Hosanna to the king. Excitement prevailed throughout the city. How many of you here has got a palm branch in your hand today? If you got one, just come on, give away to it and say, Hail to the king. Amen? Come on, somebody praise God in this house today. Praise the Lord. Well, you're all kind of quiet in here today. Yes. Praise the Lord. It's all right to say amen. God loves that. Yes. It's all right to say hallelujah. Amen. It's all right to glorify the king of kings. Amen? Wow. But then Jesus looked over his waiting audience and must have seen the mixtures of expressions on their faces. Those that was excited, those that probably had questions, those who were probably saying, who is he? Who does he think he is? And I imagine he's seen all those types of faces. And he dealt with that. There were those who loved him, Perhaps Bartimaeus was there, a man who had received his sight, no longer in his beggar rags. How about Zacchaeus? He had paid his debt back to society and had made his peace with God. How about the lepers? Their skin had been cleansed. Now they were rejoicing for the healing that the Lord had given them. Maybe even Jerry's daughter was there, back to life again after experiencing death. Lazarus, Mary, Martha, and Mary Magdalene. Maybe they were all with it. Their lives reflected the love that was in their heart for this man who taught them and molded them and changed them. But also, those that had seen the miracles of God, yes. those that had been touched by the hand of God, also the Sadducees and the Pharisees were there. They were supposed to be the keepers of the law, the spiritual leaders. But Jesus had gained so much popularity that they felt threatened, so full of jealousy, and they watched him. The Roman soldiers were there, very revolt, watching any sign of rebellion against Rome. They were ready and waiting to crush any uprising. Just think about the different folks that was there when he was coming into Jerusalem. I think about that today. Think about how many of us have been touched by the hand of God. And how many times God has delivered us from sickness or helped us get through a crisis in our lives. How God has been there with us when we've been through the loss of a loved one. How He's been there to help us and give us peace and, and, he, and, he, and he holds us in His arms, so to speak. When we're going through tragic times in our lives or just going through depressions in our lives or maybe we're facing this or facing that in our lives, but God is always there with us. Yes, amen. And I wonder how many times we forget how good God has been to us. Amen. That's one thing I ask God for. Never let me forget the goodness that you have given me. 
If God gave me nothing else in my life, the day He saved my soul was the greatest miracle that ever took place in my life. Because of Him, I will live forevermore with Him in heaven in one day. I don't ever forget how good my God is to me. And I think about all these that was there that remember what He did. Maybe Lazarus, like I said, maybe Lazarus, Mark, and all them that was there. And, and knowing that Lazarus was dead and He raised him from the dead after four days of being buried. And it told him, take the Rip the clothes off of him. Get him grave. Set him loose. Get that grave stuff you bound him up with. And set him loose. Because he is free. How many knows when Jesus took sin out of your life, you became free? And I want to ask you this question. How many is still free today? I am. I don't know about you, but I am. But yet, there's always those that's going to talk to him. There's always those that are going to find fault with him. Well, and I, I hear this today a lot. If God loved us so much, why is all the chaotic and crazy things going on in our lives? Why are we going through these things? And why are the shootings are taking place in our schools? And why are people being murdered here? And, and this is happening and that's happening. And I remember reading an article one time that somebody wrote. And the Lord said, well, you've taken me out of the schools. Right. Come on. Yes. And some churches have taken him out of the churches. Right. A lot of folks have taken him out of their homes. Let me tell you something. You put him back in your homes. You put him back in your churches. You put him back in your schools. You put him back in your heart. You put him back in control of this world. And things would change rapidly. Amen. But you always got those that's going to find fault. You're always going to say, well, that's just nothing. And I imagine that's kind of what took place during that time. Well, they say that happened, but I didn't see it. They say that Lazarus died, but maybe he really did. Maybe he just fell asleep and then he just woke up. All kinds of things they might have come up with. Think about that. Wow. I, I think about these voices. I think about the things that we hear today all around us. And Jesus realizes he listened to their hosannas that soon the threatening voices would drown out the voices of love. That those crying for him to be king would soon be crying crucify him. Or simply standing aside saying nothing at all. Now Jesus is descending along the road from the Mount of Olives across the brook towards the gate. The crowd strong, the crowd, the crowd strong around him. They were all they were all there in Jerusalem, loving faces, loving faces, threatening faces, and anxious apostles. Crowds trampled almost upon one another when suddenly the whole procession stopped. It just stops. Now think about that. You find this in Luke. Do you suppose it would have been a little like rush hour on the big city expressway, one car stop? How many of you ever drove down I-4? That's all I got to tell you. One car stops, everything stops. Or coming to Tampa, one car stops, everything stops. Now it's got so bad it happens in St. Pete. I notice a lot of times we get through town and get to St. Pete, it just stops. I'm just wondering. It's kind of like a chain reaction. I can just hear the people way back in the crowd that day saying, What's the hold up? What's going on? Why don't you guys move on? We just stopped. But the people who was the closest, that Jesus could see. They realized that it was he who had stopped the parade. Then they saw his body begin to shake. Maybe at first they thought he was laughing because laughter would seem to be natural. For everyone else was laughing and joy prevailed. But then they saw his face. They saw no evidence of laughter. Rather, they saw sorrow, tears. He was not laughing, but he was the scripture tells us that Jesus reacted emotionally many times from different scenes that he saw. When he saw the poor, when he saw the hungry, when he saw the people sinning, when he saw the ill, the scripture says repeatedly that he had compassion on them. But it only tells us two times that Jesus cried. 
One time he cried at the grave of Lazarus, if you remember the story. Mary and Martha was both weeping. It says that Jesus wept with them. He wept for them. He entered into their grief with compassion. He identified with the sorrow of despair. But here we find in Luke's writing that Jesus was crying. I thought about that too. I, I, I try to think about things and try to put myself in that, that, that time frame. And here in this whole crowd, everybody's rejoicing. Everybody's excited about what's going on. And all of a sudden, the parade stops. And there Jesus is just shaking. Like I said earlier, they might have thought of him laughing, but he was crying. Now, I get excited about things sometimes. How many of you ever just got excited about something? How many of you ever been in a parade that was exciting and you were just kind of there laughing with everybody, enjoying everything that was going on? It's kind of like when you watch a Tampa Bay football game and they win. <laughs> you get excited. They don't win a lot. But when they win, you get excited. You pull for them. I've been excited for my Tampa Bay Rays. They, they've been winning. They kind of messed up last night, but... They've been winning. So you get excited. Yeah, I go there. And I'm not a hockey fan, but I'm pulling for Tampa Bay Light, and I thought they just walked through everything. But when they, if they win tonight, I'll be excited for them. But here, excitement creates excitement. But something happened here with all this excitement that was going on. Jesus began to cry. Wow. This was the second occasion. He looked at the city of Jerusalem. He saw the mixture of faces, the masses of humanity following the crowds there. He realized the emptiness of their lives. They had not heard the message of peace. They did not understand the purpose of his coming. I'd like to read Luke 19:41 again and through 44. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, if thou hast known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hidden from thy eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, that thy enemies, now look at that, thy enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee on every side. And they shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knew it, not, not the time of thy visitation. When I begin to read that, what he was saying, he said, the eyes, they had eyes, but they didn't see. They had ears, but they didn't hear. They missed the whole point of the message that God has given them. So I didn't try to place myself in that time when I read that. I tried to place myself in this time. We have ears. Are we truly hearing what thus saith the Word of God? We have eyes. Are we truly seeing what is happening all around us? Wow. Jesus. Are we missing the whole point? Do we realize that the devil is coming at us with everything that he has? He's out to destroy churches. He's out to destroy families. Yes. He's out to destroy everything that he can. But if you know what's happening to folks today is the same thing that happened back then. We've heard, but we're not hearing. Right. We see, but we're not seeing. And I wonder how much Jesus is weeping over us today. Yes. Because we don't understand. Because he knows that destruction is soon coming. Yes. Why? Because we won't hear and we won't see. Now listen, the fact that they weighed palm branches showed that they didn't understand because that is exactly what they did when the Maccabees overthrew the Syrian oppressors and reestablished the worship in the temple. By weighing palm branches, they were showing they expected Jesus to be another warlord, another general of the army who would lead them to overthrow the Romans. They were saying that they were ready to pick up their swords, shields, and go to war if he would lead them. Lead them. But we know something different today. We wave our palm branches today to recognize that we know that Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen? Amen. That's what we wave them for today. To recognize. Because He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Praise the Lord. Because Jesus looked at them and, and, and they thought He was
was coming to overthrow the, the whole government and they were going to sit down and he was going to be all this. He didn't, he didn't come for that. He could have called his angels down and destroyed the ar armies. He, he could have handled all that. But you know what he did? Listen to what he said. Jesus said, I didn't come for that purpose. I came to show you a more excellent way. He said, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. If someone smites you on the cheek, turn to him and the other also. If someone wants your coat, give him your shirt as well. If they command you to carry their pack a mile, go to them. In other words, Jesus was saying, I come to show you what love is all about. How many knows that Jesus is nothing but love? A man that, that came and was willing to die on the cross. We'll talk a lot about that next week. To die on the cross that you and I might have life. Jesus was weeping and Jesus was crying over Jerusalem because yes. he knew what was going to happen. The nation of Israel had the opportunity to show Rome something new, different. But because they didn't understand Jesus, because they completely misunderstood his mission, Jesus wept over them because the opportunity would be taken away that they would never have again. These were God's people. God's chosen people. God had loved them, led them across the wilderness into the promised land. But they did not understand the Messiah when he walked in their midst. Because of that, Jesus wept. Do we understand him today? So let me ask you a personal question and nobody can answer anything. Just think about it. Are you satisfied with your life today? Are you satisfied with your walk? with God today? Have you found that total peace in Him today? If not, get to know Him more in your life. There's times in my life I just want to throw my hands up and say, that's it. Anybody ever done that? Everybody, if you have, do this with me. That's it. I've had it. I'm done with it. I'm over with it. I get there a lot of times. I don't know about you. Sometimes I let the frustrations of things just get to me. And then all of a sudden, I, I hear that little voice in the back of my head. and says, man, now just calm down. Everything's going to be all right. Sometimes you'll tell Sheila to tell me to change my attitude. And she don't mind telling me. Husbands, how many know your wife don't mind telling you? <laughs> be, yeah, be truthful. I like it. I like honest men. They don't mind telling you. But sometimes I just, I just threw that in there just for the. <laughs> but sometimes I just want to say, enough is enough. I've had enough. But you know what? I need to change that thought process. You know what I need to tell the devil? Devil, enough is enough. I had enough of you trying to mess with me. I serve a risen Savior, and His name is Jesus, and He's given me authority and power over you. So, devil, I'm not putting up with your junk anymore. Amen. And when I can get to that point, peace just comes right back into my life. Amen. Come on, folks. It just comes back in my life. Because I understand one thing today. I understand this. I don't know it all. But I understand this, that I know who God is. Amen. And I know that He lives in here in me. And I know the Bible tells me no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Nothing the devil throws at me can overcome because I have Christ in my life. Now, if I give it to him, that's the whole point. I gotta give it to him. I gotta let him handle it. When we were growing up, and, and back in the day, when we all was young clipper snappers and we thought we were Tarzan. Actually, I met Sheila swinging. She the first time she seen me, I was swinging from a tree. I became our Tarzan. <laughs> I was a skinny Tarzan, though. And Sammy said I could do the hula hoop with the charity I was so skinny. <laughs> yeah, that was Sammy. That's the one who said that. I told you about that. He came up with that. It was pretty good. But, but I was her Tarzan. And she was my Jane. And God put her in my life. And she's still my Jane. Well, she's my Sheila today. But where was I at? <laughs> I just left me for a minute. I just went blank. I had a point, folks. I had a point. We got away from you. The watch 
wanted to come back in just a minute, but I, I'm going. Oh, Lord. i got to move on. They say when you get past 60, it happens. So let's, let's go back here. Uh, it'll come back. I don't know about the hula hoop, though. But people had a hard time. I think I know where I was at. Had a hard time really seeing who Jesus is. And I'm wondering if we had that hard time today really seeing who Jesus is in our life. Just think about that. What a contrast. As he set upon the beast of burden, he sees the towering temple of God shall lay against the sky. But beyond that, in the years immediately ahead, he sees the armies of Titus around the holy city. He sees temple, temple stones being taken down and the whole city leveled. He sees bodies in the streets and blood running in the gutters. And hundreds of thousands of people crying because they're starving to death while Titus waits for Jerusalem to surrender. That's what he's seen. And that's what he understood that was happening. Can you just imagine if they could have recognized who Christ was at that time? That maybe that might not have taken place. Could you imagine if this world could see who Christ is today? That we could get rid of hunger. The battles of this world would no longer exist. People can live together in harmony and in peace. But we're missing something. I think we're missing to recognize truly who He is. All, all because they didn't recognize Messiah when He came. How different their lives could have been, how different history the history of Israel could have been if they only recognized the one who came right into the midst on a colt. So conclusion to this today. As we know that Jesus entered into Jerusalem knowing that he was going to face certain death. But he still went. He didn't hesitate. He knew there was a lot of trouble ahead of him. He knew there would be a lot of things he had to deal with. But he just kept moving forward. He did this for each and every one of us. Each and every one of us is in here today. And not just us, but all over the world. He did it for us because He loves us so much. You know, I, I thought I could love. And I thought I understood love. But when Jesus came in my life, then I began to understand a whole lot more about what love truly is. Because God places a love in your heart. He teaches you how to love. So when I begin to look at all this and begin to see that three and a half years that he preached and walked upon this earth, preaching and teaching, some got it, but the most did. I've been preaching 36 years. Some gets it, but a lot doesn't. And sometimes I even ask myself, am I getting it? And that's when I hear that still voice. Once again, the Lord will speak to me. And I begin to just surrender everything to Him. I know some of us are facing, facing battles today. I know there's things that we don't understand in our lives. And I know we have a lot of questions. And a lot of your questions might not ever be answered. I have a lot of questions. And I hope one day Jesus will sit down with me in heaven and let us just have a chat. Maybe when I get to heaven, I don't even want to worry about it, even chat about it. I'll be so happy just to be in heaven. Amen? Amen. Be in the presence of God. But I can guarantee you this. If he can take a heathen like me and change my life and put me behind a pulpit to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'm not perfect by no means, but I'm striving to be a better man every day. I'm striving to do more and more for Him every day of my life. If He can take someone like me and give me that peace and give me that love and that compassion, He can do it for each and every one of us sitting in this building today. Amen. I remember when I first got saved and I accepted Christ. I got lazy. 
Because I read a scripture that said anything I ask for in his name is mine. But I took that scripture out of context. I found out real quickly, if I don't work, I don't eat. I just thought it should all come to me. The sad part, a lot of folks think that way. That they're not going to have any heartaches, they're not going to have any trials, no tribulations, no battles in my life. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying is that if I ask Him to help me get through something I'm going through, He will help me. I, I think about, and, and, and Sheila can hit me later, but in our 40, almost 46 years of marriage coming up, we haven't always, we, we've had our moments. Anybody ever had moments? Y'all know what I mean by moments? That we try to figure, I try to tell her I'm boss and she don't listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> and she still in 46 years hasn't listened yet. I keep thinking one day she's going to get it, but that don't happen. We've had our times, we've had our, our I mean, we probably said some things to each other we wish we'd never said. But I love her too much to allow anything to get in between me and her. So I don't mind her being boss. <laughs> because most of us men don't have a choice. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw it that way. It just didn't die. No, I don't mind giving in. There's sometimes I don't want to give in. So what we've learned to do in our years of marriage is we just kind of go our separate way. Now, one of the biggest words we can't tell each other is to shut up. Or be quiet. Because that's just about as bad. She'll do this to me. You know what that means? I better zip it up right now because it's all going to come down. But because I have Christ in my life, it doesn't mean I'm not going to face these battles. But let me tell you something I found out. My wife, my family, and you and my family too, I want you to know that. It's worth fighting for. There's nothing in this world that can ever take the place of my wife. I told her, I said, if, if the Lord decides to take one of us, he needs to take me first because I couldn't function without you. I don't even know how to wash clothes. I don't. I can cook an egg. But I get, I get eggshells in it now and then. I cook sausage. I can grill, but I can't cook. I do know how to run back and can't she taught me that a while back. <laughs> <laughs> but love outshines it all because you know what? I want to love her the way Jesus loves me. And we all should love our wives and our family the way Jesus loves us. Amen? He taught us how to love. In conclusion, Matthew added that as Jesus looked at the city, he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you together as a hen gathered her chicks beneath her wings, but you would not come. Listen, folks, God is trying to gather us together today. He's trying to pull us in underneath his wings. Today, just like Jerusalem, we find ourselves in the presence of Jesus. I wonder what he finds when we look into our when he looks into our faces. Does he see people concerned about so many things, worried about the job security, worried about their health or lack of it? Does he see people who are so busy doing things here and there, so busy that they never bother bother to consider things that are eternally important? Does he see people who recognize him for who he is, the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God? When he turns and looks into our lives, I wonder we weep once again because of what he sees. Do we stand there, John? This is the week before we celebrate the death and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. This is the week that we celebrate him coming into Jerusalem knowing what he was going to face. But this is also to be the week that our lives can change. That where our lives can take a brand new look at everything. How many of us today know without a doubt that God lives within you? 
You know that without a doubt. Oh, hallelujah. I'm going to ask him to go ahead and play a song and lead us into a song. How many of you do something with me this morning? If you would, just grab somebody by the hand, by the reach side, if you will. If you don't have somebody beside you, reach over and grab somebody. If you grab this young lady behind you. There you go. Just grab a hand. I want you to look at that person and say, I love you with the love of the Lord. Come on, do that. Go ahead. I love you with the love of the Lord. Come on, can you say it again? I love you with the love of the Lord. Amen? Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. You will face some things this week. You will go through some battles this week. But if you will love God, the way He loves you, He's going to help you through all the battles and all the trials in your life. Amen? Amen. She and I go through battles all the time. Somebody told me one time that you preachers are not even here. You get exemption. God gives you special favor. He doesn't give me anything a special favor. He loves me just like He loves you. Matter of fact, we go through some things I think before some of the folks do so we can help them get through it. I faced everything from death, financial, house tearing up, car tearing up, changing a flat tire. I couldn't do it all. Not knowing what to do, make you feel like everybody, nobody likes me. Everybody ever felt like nobody liked you? I've been there. We go through it. But you know what I found out? When I lift my head up towards heaven, and I began talking to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He would just bring peace upon me and settle everything in my mind. So this week, as we prepare to celebrate the time of Easter, I know we're going to have a book out. I know the kids are going to hunt eggs and all that out in the park. But I want us to realize one thing. Easter is not about the bunny rabbit. Easter is about the one that died on the cross and gave his life for you and I. Amen.